Right, morning folks. Um, just to give a little bit of background introduction to who I am. Name's David Bulhari and uh, for the last two years I was the sort of uh, acting, um, or not acting, but this, the uh, director for Scotland for Rewilding Britain. I was seconded from the Scottish Government and I've now gone back to the Scottish Government, but it's a real pleasure to come down here and just give you some sort of personal insights into what I see as the challenges moving forward in Scotland for rewilding. The title of the talk was to give a vision for a rewilded Scotland. Um, I, can't I can't describe what that vision would actually look like on the ground. So what I'm going to do is try and, um, as an audience, you'll have variable knowledge of what the challenges are in Scotland, and I'd like to leave you at the end with at least a feel for what my perception is of where the key challenges are. Um, Okay, <clears throat> so I speak in a lot of community halls in Scotland and, and we discuss things and this is, I just need to show this and then people think I'm absolutely nuts and then the sort of the audience engages because where Scotland's at at the moment culturally and socially, the idea of introducing something as big as brown bears is just way off the radar. What is closer is the idea of maybe formalising the wild boar. We've got beaver back. Scottish Government has just accepted that wild beaver are there to stay. And lynx probably isn't too far away as long as we get the approach right. The, um, the other thing I'd just quite like to, 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 to get across is that in Scotland at the moment, there are a massive amount of ecological restoration projects going on. So rewilding is not new, it's been going on for a long time and it's going on at quite a big scale right across Scotland. This is um, Glen Feshy, that's the River Feshy, and I don't know if you can see there, the picture's not very good, but there's an awful lot of tree regeneration that's happened in a very short space of time because the owner decided just to reduce the deer numbers. <coughs> and you've got, as a result, a sudden pulse. That's not the only area. There's a, this is a charity working down in the southern uplands at Carifran and they've gone to achieve woodland restoration, but they've gone largely through a, a planting model. However, most of Scotland, in terms of, and when I talk about Scotland, what my talk's going to be about is that, and I'll show you on a map coming up, <coughs> is that to understand Scotland, Scotland's got a lot of fertile areas, and it's got some uplands, and those uplands are referred to as the less favoured areas in agricultural terms. Much of those, the highlands, if you like, in the uplands, looks like this, totally devoid of trees, um, and not much grows there. And I guess in terms of listening to the talks yesterday, the geography and the climate and everything about the soil types is very different to what you're hearing yesterday. Um, so there's a sort of a, a view. That's the challenge. How are we going to rewild those areas? Now, this map is quite interesting. It's prepared by... <coughs> um, the, well, the green areas on that map show the land parcels in Scotland that theoretically are put over to nature conservation, either through private land ownership or being held by environmental bodies or government owned. <coughs> the impression I want you to take away from that map is there is a lot of green parcels on there. Um, and that's all I want you to take away at the moment. The next thing is that having worked in this area for two years and still working in policy in Scottish government, there is an impasse in terms of with landowners, with community groups, with individuals and with government around this word rewilding. So it's had a bit of a publicity spell in the press, it's quietened down and everybody's looking at it thinking this is quite difficult, it's quite difficult to move that change. So faced with that difficulty we've got echo chambers like this one where there's a lot of enthusiastic people speaking about it and talking about the issues and ecological challenges and so on. Whereas from a Scottish perspective, I'm looking at it and saying, guys, ecology is not the challenge. These are not the challenges that are going to be the barriers to moving forward rewilding. And this graph is used um, by salespeople. So if you're taking, let's say, it was mobile phones and you're trying to market them, if you've got a new product and you're putting it in the market, you will always get these people here. These are us, the early adopters. But this is the chasm in the graph. And in marketing terms, crossing that chasm is the key issue and rewilding at the moment has, isn't managed to cross that. And what they're looking for is pragmatists, people who will look at the rewilding model and say, actually, that works for me. 
Now, Charlie, in terms of what he's done at NEP, is one of those pragmatists, if you like. <coughs> and that's a really good example. What you need to cross it is a pragmatist in pain. And Charlie sort of outlined some economic arguments as to where his financial pain was coming from and why this model worked. We don't have those examples in Scotland. I just also wanted to remind myself and you that in terms of when I use the word rewilding, I am talking about these three things. So process-led, scale, and in perpetuity. So the challenge for Scotland is not all those green little land parcels. It's doing something that is over and above and bigger than those. <coughs> Excuse me. This is just a quick summary. Um, the current position in Scotland is up here. We have an anthropogenic landscape. It's largely depleted. There's species in decline. And our conservation approach is species and habitat based. So it's a product based approach. Um, the scale, we are very fortunate in the sense that we have some large parcels of land. Um, over 50% of our land area is owned by 400 people or whatever. It's very unusual in a European context. But the key thing to remember is that even though you've got these large land parcels, is that the owners have rights, absolute legal rights. So it doesn't matter what we as ecologists or we as environmental bodies want. If the people who hold the rights in the land aren't motivated to change, change isn't happening. The, um, the, the rewilded argument is really simple. It's just process-led at a significantly larger scale. And ideally, saying that in order to protect the investment, you want security beyond the ownership right. And there are ways that, that can be done. <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about is the, the, the challenges here. So you've got baby bathwater arguments. And that works in two ways. One is that in terms of species and habitat-based conservation, rewilding has to work alongside that in the short term. If rewilding sets itself up to sort of threaten some of those specialist interests, then you're asking for a fight that you don't necessarily need. The other one is, in terms of the baby bathwater, is that the highlands of Scotland are a way of life for many people. And if you imply that rewilding is going to change that way of life, and that cultural heritage is in some way being in the wrong direction, then it's not going to happen either. Those are not, the baby bathwater stuff is that you can still have rewilding. You don't need to throw these things away. There's an ecological debate around how you rewild with our current species com complement. Um, there's another ecological debate about how you rewild if you reintroduce species, because that changes it, particularly around about large predators. And then there's this whole thing around about land use change. I'm going to say more about this, and apologies for speaking quickly, but I'm trying to pack in a lot. The, um, in terms of the scale, the only way you're going to get the scale up to 100 square kilometers is through collaboration. So you're going to have to get different landowner types to collaborate. And then there is this challenge, and I don't have answers to some of the issues that I'm raising, but the capital value of land is a big issue for some people. And it will be a barrier, because if you interfere in here and you want in perpetuity, you are taking away the capital value from the current owner. So focusing in on the challenges, what my belief is, they're not ecological, they are simply economic, social, and cultural. And as a movement, if people are interested in uh, moving down the path of rewilding, that's where the focus of attention should be. A, just so you're on the same page as me, Scotland has different types of land ownership. This is a very crude way to categorize it. You've got land held privately, you've got land held in trust, you've got land held by the state, and you've got community land ownership. They're all very different, and they require different levers to influence change. So in terms of economics, Sorry, the next two parts of the talk, I'm going to speak a little bit about economics. I want to make three points. I'm going to speak a little bit about social cultural change. The economic arguments are really interesting. I don't have the answers, but I just want to throw out some curious points. One is the capital values. There's another thing round about revenue. So ecotourism, as I'll show in a minute, is on a massive rate of increase in Scotland. So you can make money out of marketing. NEP's showing it. Lots of places in Scotland are showing that as well. Um, there is a slight concern about capacity. That is that you can bring in a lot of people and you can grab their money, but what's that doing to the way of life locally? Because the single track roads are all congested and so on. And then the third one is about security, is that if people change, 
to this way of capturing an income, is it going to last? An interesting thing I just thought about yesterday when I, was, when I was talking about this is that there is choice and desire. So a lot of people, the private landowners that own those estates, you, sort of, you might think that they want to make money. Well, most of those estates run at a loss. So revenue generation is not a key driver for them. It's social cultural issues. There's an interesting, and there's an interesting thing that challenges that thinking, though, which is that um, through the grants for renewable energies, many Highland estates went down the road of putting in hydro schemes. Hydro schemes is an easy way to increase the revenue coming into the estate without interfering with your way of life. So it's not that they're totally insensitive to revenue generation, it's the type of revenue generation that's the issue. <coughs> On the, the capacity issue, I'd just like to mention three areas. So for those of you that know Scotland, if you look at Sky at the moment, Sky is panicking about the number of tourists it's getting. It doesn't have the infrastructure to cope. There's a place called the Ferry Pools. The busloads of people are going there. There is no infrastructure for toilets or all the rest of it. And it's just carnage. So they've totally destroyed what was really a nice area. And that's, that's happening in lots of areas in Scotland at the moment, is that the, the desire to capture and market ecotourism is growing faster than the infrastructure. And because of that, there's a bit of a backlash and sensitivity as to whether this is the right way forward just now. Um, Route 500, that's just a drive around the north of Scotland. Um, it's great, massive increase in tourism, but just desperate if you're trying to get your children to the school in the morning. Um, <clears throat> Mull's the same, we were discussing with John the whole situation on seagulls and mull, you know, sounds great. If you look at the global figures, yes, mull now captures a lot more money onto the island, but the question is, is that money captured in a way that relates in any way to land use? Is it captured in a way that's shared? And the answer to that is no, it's not. Um, these are just some interesting figures about ecotourism or, or, or tourism in Scotland. So five billion pounds is what is the generated value for tourism in Scotland. What's more interesting is that nature-based tourism is 1.4. And out of that nature-based tourism, it, it's generally sort of spoken about in five categories. And if you look at ecotourism, while it's not the highest proportion of the 1.4, it's this percentage growth that's really interesting. Um, and I want to speak something about social culture. And there's three points I want to make here. I can check. I get them in my mind. So... The first one is, I'm going to speak very personally to you as a, as a Scottish person, if you like. So I don't know how many of you have been to Village Bay in St Kilda, but Village Bay is an area where it was evacuated because the people just couldn't live there anymore. But there is something funny in the Scottish psyche that everybody knows about St Kilda and the evacuation of St Kilda, and everybody knows about the clearances. And the clearances were driven by two things. They were driven by a push factor, which was starvation, People were desperately poor and they were looking for a new life. But they were also driven by people being pushed off the land and burnt out of their houses. History argues about that. I, I'm not here to argue about that. I'm just saying that's deep in the psyche of Scottish people. As is the carvings on the Croic Church in Glencalvey, which I don't know how many of you have heard this story, but the people that were burnt out of their houses um, gathered at the church, and that's their names inscribed on the windows. And what that says is the wicked generation. And their feeling was that they didn't understand, they're very religious people, they didn't understand why they were being punished and driven out of their houses. And you can see that for me, even to speak about it, is emotional. It's not that I was involved, it's just that, that you, to understand Scottish psyche, you need to understand that, that that's in our heads. And there's a sense of injustice somewhere in there. The next part, and this is the, this is the paradox about Scottish psyche, as it were. The next part is that those people were cleared off the land. And in some areas, the Glen that I'm going to speak about later on, the, the number of people that were cleared out was like 3,500 out of one strath. So we're not talking a few houses. We're talking about a massive amount of people. There's been a lot of discussion about deer grazing and deer numbers. Can you imagine how many red deer 3,000 people need to survive? especially when they're starving. So the biggest impact on deer was people. I mean, I just don't think that, I don't think that takes a lot of science to work out. It's just that hungry people will eat deer. Um, 
But deer change. The, the way that we look at deer has changed. So there's large areas now that are the preserve of sporting estates. And there are lots of people who have grown up and their way of life now is to be absolute experts in taking people out in the pouring rain in the midges and giving a day that is just absolutely memorable. It'll be a day that you'll, you'll never forget. Um, so there's the owners of the estate out enjoying that type of day. These are, that's part of our culture as well. So even though we're burned out the houses to make way for the sheep and the sporting estates, this is now part of our culture as well. And we'll fight for that as well. I could get equally passionate about that. And I understand the paradox, but it's just part of the confusion. Um, there are many other examples of our way of life. So you've got the Highland Hill cattle, you've got the crofter, um, and you've also got this. This is, this is the sport I play. But the point here is that this is what we do for a sport. So we are naturally combative people. And I, I, I thought about that yesterday, and then I was listening to all the ecologists, and they were speaking about the terminology, and is it woodland cover, or was it totally covered, or was it slightly open, or was it this, or was it that? And I was thinking, you know what, Scotland's maybe not so bad. At least we, can find, <laughs> at least we contain our combative spirit to the sports field. So moving quickly on, um, the, in terms of what's happening in Scotland, in terms of the two years I was there, we looked around at where the opportunities were for process-led scale and perpetuity. And we came up and we identified some areas. Um, this area down here is, is uh, Southern Uplands. I showed a slide at the start where Carifron is. This area in here, that's Glenfeshia, slowed us side of that. This is beside this estate here, which is National Trust for Scotland, Mar Lodge. And then in terms of here, you've got the Forestry Commission, you've got RSPB. This collectively is an area that is incredibly exciting in terms of ecological restoration. And, that's, and that's, that happened well before rewilding um, became into the, the press and psyche. So the amount of regeneration of native pine... Oh, sorry. ...going on in these areas um, has to be recognised. So the question is, where can you add value? If you're in your organisation coming in, where's the opportunity to add value? There are other areas which I don't have time to speak about. The way I'm going to speak about here is part of what's known as the South Ross Deer Management Group. And it's a, almost an east-west corridor running through here, which is from Strathglass to Afric to Kintail. And this land here is owned by the state, managed on behalf of the state by the Forest Commission. There's a private state in the middle. And then here, it's owned by the National Trust for Scotland. I'm just going to speak about the potential that that area offers. Um, the, the red lungs either side, these are traditional sporting estates. And indeed, this, this area in the middle, with the exception of the forest or the state-owned land, is all managed as sporting estate as well. So to give you an idea of what it looks like on the east side, this is a strath, so just basically the bottom of the strath is incredibly fertile. But interesting to note that the deer, historically the deer would have wintered in there, at least the stags would have, but they're all fenced out of there. Um, and then if you move um, slightly looking to the west, you just see the strath petering out, and then you go into the glens, this is Glen Affric, and then you go um, through to Kintail. And what the opportunity is, is that the, the work that Rewilding Britain did in terms of employing me, and working also with people from Rewilding Europe, this is Franz and um, Wouter, who came across, that's, that's engendered within the community a sort of a, a thought that maybe they could be more involved in the management of the state-owned land. And I don't know how much of you, or many of you, will be familiar with the land reform movement in Scotland, but a key part of that is giving opportunity to communities to buy and own land. And um, with that comes significant financial assistance from government. So what the community is looking at in this area at the moment is a few things. So one is that they would dearly like to be one of the top 10 sites for rewilding its scale in Scotland. I'm going to have to check that. It's not quite right. There is a group of people within the community that would like to explore that. But it's a fairly cross-sectoral group, and they still have to take that view to the community and do scoping studies. And ultimately, in terms of buying, they have to go to a vote. But that's the direction of travel. And in terms of Scottish politics, if a community is leading and showing success, because seeing is believing, then the chances of political change and policy change coming on the back of it is really high, far higher than if a private landowner tries to do it. Um, 
So in summary, the key points I'd like you to take away is that the model for Scotland in terms of progressing rewilding is that seeing is believing. NEP is absolutely fantastic because you come here and you see something and you believe it. Scotland doesn't have that, so we need to get something on the ground where seeing is believing. And as part of the seeing is believing, we need the economic story as well. The emphasis on community-led, I think, is really important. I think if you look at the different landowner types in Scotland, the private landowners have seen and are aware of the opportunity, and with the exception of one, nobody's really moving. They're not convinced by the arguments because, on one hand, the economic benefits aren't strong enough and the desire's not there. On the other hand, the social cost is quite high. Um, and that, that's sort of summarized by these two comments here. The push factors are low. People are not starving. People are not in pain. You don't have much discomfort in the Scottish sporting estate system at the moment. It may be coming, but it's not there just now. The pull factors in terms of finance, they're not that strong. And in terms of the renewable energy example, yes, if you can get easy money into the account and it doesn't disrupt the social side, then you'll do it. But in terms of um, the financial gains against the social cost, it's not really a strong equation. And in terms of the ecology side, um, people can see the benefit, but they love hearing you guys argue. There is nothing better than knowing that the ecologists don't agree. So if you want to move Scotland in terms of rewilding agenda, this all needs to tie together with a good news story. And you know, people were talking about sorting out the terminology and so on. Yes, that will help. But I just say, you know, publicly, kind of, it would really help the movement if ecologists started to say, yes, we're not trying to throw out the baby with the bathwater in terms of species habitat and so on. It is just part of the complement of conservation that could exist in the country. And then finally, I'd just like to sort of close. If, if we can get some of that stuff right, then maybe this combative nature that Scots naturally have, maybe we can direct it into something that's far more constructive than uh, some of the stuff we've done in the past. Thank you. My name is uh, Frans Vera. Um, when you talked about uh, that uh, seeing is believing, I was thinking about some person I always refer to, Danny Kahneman, and he says, our nature is loss aversion. That means loss hurts me more than gain does well. And um, therefore, he says, if you want to change, you need, if you talk to people who only think about loss, they will always put the gain against a certain baseline, which is mostly the status quo, and then you lose. And our experience with um, floodplains areas was that even 10 hectares or 20 hectares can be important for what you're saying, seeing is believing. So the experience we have in the Netherlands is that it may not be always wise by having starting with 100 square kilometers but uh, you can start with 20 hectares or 40 hectares with something that I was missing in the story. It's, I'm always surprised that in Scotland it's about deer. You had thousands of cattle, you had the aurochs, and it may be too far to have the brown beer, but what not about other herbivores which you can manage very easily on a small scale like wild horses, wild, wild catting, doing on a small scale. What's your idea about that? Yeah. The, um, so, really good questions, and there's sort of two parts to it. So, the, the first one is in terms of the small scale, absolutely agree. And if you go back to the map of the green parcels, those are the small scale. It is happening at a really big scale. So, if you want to add value with a the debate, then the area to add the value over and above the small scale work that's going on is to sort of say, well, what happens if you connect this at a landscape scale? So that was that. In terms of the deer, again, in, you know, in terms of people, I hear people speaking about deer in Scotland. And at the moment, the red deer population exists between below one deer per square kilometer up to about 40 deer per square kilometer based on summer range. In the wintertime, that massively changes depending on the topography. Um, with that level, and then, with that level of grazing pressure, 
and the knowledge that Scotland has no natural tree line and that in lots of areas our trees, our pine trees, are at an age where they're dying and there's no young trees below them. The, the opportunity to have the debate that you're having about other grazing animals um, isn't so apparent. Unless you're in some areas like I showed you in Glenfeshie or in Abernethy or in Glenafric where the restoration has happened but nobody's thought through as to, well, now you've just got wall-to-wall -wall trees and jungle and a heavy understory and there's nothing breaking it up. Scotland hasn't got there and that would be part of the landscape scale. But in order to give confidence to the ecologists that you can do that, they kind of need to sort of see woodland regeneration happening out here. If that makes sense? Yes, it makes sense, but what I was in Abernethy and I was just walking on a cushion of moss yeah. and red deer will not open up the soil, which is in fact a generation mist for Scots pine. It needs bare soil. Yeah. Cattle do, yeah. while boar does. So I'm, I'm always astonished that the whole discussion about regeneration of trees is only focusing on red deer, while keeping out all the other things. I was just interesting about uh, Roy Dennis had once an experiment with heifers, and I don't know what it took there, but if you see how, what cattle does, they really yeah. are heavy animals opening up the soil. No, and I, I and wild boar, of course. Yeah, and I absolutely understand that. I guess the thing is that we're not, we're not discussing the same geographic bits of land. So you're, the areas that you're talking about are areas where the grazing pressure has been massively reduced down to below one deer per square kilometer. And you've got this understory and the seeds when they germinate, they can't even, the roots can't even get into the soil. So that, that, that's understood. And in a sense of baby bathwater, I showed a picture of, Highland, of uh, hill cattle and you know, they could be moved into those areas quite easily and that could happen. But if you look at the challenge that Scotland faces, it's in these vast open areas where that isn't happening. There is no there isn't even heather on the ground, it's just been grazed bare to within an inch of its life, if you like. And it's, that's where the change needs to take place. Once some of that vegetation comes back, you need to manage it with, as you say, your multiple grazing animals. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay.